Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, service. It's good that you're able to, to join us here for Sunday morning worship. The Apostle Paul said, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm standing here in the chapel building and I'm looking out at empty chairs and I'm wishing that you were all here and that we were all gathered together to worship the name of the Lord. We, we want this crisis to come to an end for many reasons. Uh, and one of those reasons is we want to gather together, together for fellowship and to worship the name of the Lord our God. Let us keep praying that the Lord will bring this pandemic to an end and that we will be able to gather together soon. The Welsh government has issued guidelines for churches reopening. Please be patient and pray for the elders and the deacons as we discussed when would be the best time to reopen uh, for all the church. You have, would have received by this stage several communications already. Uh, we shall continue to communicate with you and to keep you updated. We know that we are all united in love for God and for our desire to worship and glorify him. Therefore, differences of perspective on risks and related matters can be opportunities for us to bear with one another, to look out for the interests of others, to be patient and kind, and to assume the best of one another. Let us pray that God will grant us grace to move forward now in love and unity. While we have come together in this unusual way, I'm leading the service here in the chapel building and you're sitting at home. But why have we, we come together? We've come together as the family of God. We've come together in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask forgiveness of our sins and to seek his grace so that through his son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. Ephesians chapter one and verse three, it says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Let's worship God. Let's give praise to him as we sing our first hymn, What a Faithful God Have I.
We are going to pray a prayer of confession now, and this will appear on your screen. So please join me in this prayer of confession. Almighty God, who is rich in mercy to all those who call upon you, hear us as we humbly come to you confessing our sins, imploring your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our words and deeds and by the sinful affections of our hearts. We confess before you our disobedience and ingratitude, our pride and willfulness, our failures and shortcomings towards you and others. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. By your Spirit, enable us hereafter to serve and please you in newness of life, and this through the merit and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We do thank you, our Father, for the assurance of pardon we have through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We believe that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Make us, our Father, more steadfast in the faith and in our hope towards you. Give us grace so that for your sake, we would show genuine love towards every man and woman. Teach us to forgive from our hearts, to mortify our flesh, to deny ourselves and to follow you. We believe in your word and your word does tell us that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and that your ears are attentive to our prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We pray that we, your people, that we would avoid evil, that we would pursue righteousness, and we pray that your ears would be attentive to the cries of our hearts. We ask that as your body, that we would be like-minded, as your people, would be, we would be sympathetic, loving one another, that we would be compassionate, that we would be humble. Give us grace so that we will not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Rather, that we would repay evil with blessing. For to this we were called so that we would inherit a blessing. We ask for you to change our behavior so that we would live pure and reverent lives. Renew us. Renew us, our God, by your Holy Spirit. Reform us after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we would not seek outward beauty or the boastful pride of life, rather that all of us would have inner beauty and purity. Give us gentle and quiet spirits, which your word tells us is of great worth in your sight. May husbands be considerate with their wives and treat them with respect knowing that they are heirs with them of the gracious gift of life. May wives put their hope in God like the holy women of the past. We intercede for our children. They are precious to us. We pray that they would obey their parents in the Lord and enjoy long life on the earth, walking with God. For those who are working we ask that you would empower them to work for their employers with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, working wholeheartedly, serving the Lord. For those who are looking for work, we ask that you would provide for their every need, remembering your promise which says, my God shall supply all my needs. We remember those who are suffering for doing what is right. We ask for you to give them your bless them, blessing. Teach them, we, we pray, to revere Christ as Lord in their hearts and make us all prepared to give an answer to, for the reason of the hope that, that is in us. And may we do this with, with gentleness and respect. We remember our Lord Jesus Christ who, who also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us back to God. We know that he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. 
We know that he has gone into heaven and we worship him there at your right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. We pray for you to guide our leaders. We pray for you to guide all the leaders of the nations across the world. Guide them in your ways of peace and justice. Enlighten and direct all who are in authority. We pray that many who are in authority would come to put their trust in in the Lord Jesus Christ and that they would seek your honor and glory. We pray for an end to this pandemic and for the restoration of normal life. Especially we pray for you to bring us back together so that we can gather in person to worship your name. Give wisdom to the elders and deacons to prepare the way for this to happen and keep us united as your body, looking out for the interests of others. We ask that you would speak to us from your word now. Enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ. May we never forget your goodness to us and may we show forth our thankfulness, not only with the words of our mouths, but also by the service of our lives, both now and in all eternity. And we pray in Jesus' name. Well, children, I hope you have been enjoying the 10 things videos which have been made to show you very important things about the Bible. These 10 things videos, 10 things that everyone should know about the Bible, they they were made for the children of our church, but they were also made for the schools where Paul and I do the assemblies. And in this, uh, these 10 things videos, there's, there's a theme song. It's called The Bible um, Starts With Creation. It's the theme song for the 10 things series. And uh, we are going to hand over to Paul now, and he is going to uh, lead us in the song, 10 things that everyone should know about the Bible. Here's the theme song, The Bible Starts with creation. Hi everybody, thank you Andrew. Our theme song again with a few more verses today. But let's start with the chorus. The Bible starts with creation, the final book's revelation. In between are so many stories telling us all about God. Have you read about Adam? Have you read about Eve? Told by God not to eat the fruit, but by the serpent deceived. The Bible starts with creation, the final book's revelation. In between are so many stories telling us all about God. I know you know about Noah, God told him build a big boat. Gather creatures of every kind, above the flood you will float. The Bible starts with creation, the final book's revelation. In between are so many stories telling us all about God. Abraham and wife Sarah were far too old to have kids. God said soon you will have a son, and nine months later they did. The Bible starts with creation, the final book's revelation. In between are so many stories telling us all about God. Have you heard about Moses, who set the Israelites free? Pharaoh's army was chasing them, but Moses parted the sea. The Bible starts with creation, the final book's revelation. In between are so many stories telling us all about God. And back to Andrew. Our reading this morning is from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Make sure you have a Bible open in front of you. 1 Samuel chapter 19. And if you have a bookmark, put it in there because I'll be preaching from this passage a little later on and referring to some verses in this chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 19 beginning at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. 
Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life into his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before. Once more, war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, Bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Seku. And he asked, Where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah. But the Spirit of God came even on him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say, Is Saul also among the prophets? Amen. We're going to sing again. And uh, our hymn is, Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. It speaks of Jesus Christ, the Lord, Lord's anointed, his crucifixion of his death and how that brings life to all who trust in him. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Let's sing together.
1 Samuel chapter 19, have that passage open in front of you. The Lord protects his people. Do you believe that? The Lord protects his people. This is one of the most basic truths in the scriptures. It teaches us that the Lord protects his people, but it's also one of the hardest truths to to get our heads around. We know that the Lord protects us, while at the same time, the Lord's people often experience severe hardships. We think about Christians who are suffering for their faith, suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of friends who have cancer, Christian friends, and they're battling with cancer. We think of our own troubles. There is pain. There are strained relationships. There are problems at work. I know pastors in South Africa who, due to the COVID-19 crisis, are suffering with severe poverty. We know that the Lord protects his people, but we also know from experience that Christian people suffer. There are many verses in the Bible which tell us that God protects his people. Only last week I was reading from the book of Job, and I was reading about Eliphaz. And Eliphaz, he speaks to Job, and he tells that Job that the Lord protects his people. He, he says to Job, in famine, the Lord will deliver you from death and in battle from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue and need not fear when destruction comes. You will laugh at destruction and famine and need not fear the wild animals. Listening to Eliphaz conversing with Job, I was reminded of the Psalms and and what they say about the Lord protecting his people. Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shadow of the Most High will rest in the shelter of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Think of Psalm 121. I will lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over Israel, he will not sleep. He who watches over over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. We know that the Lord protects his people, but we also know from experience that Christian people hurt. Eliphaz says those words to a man who is suffering. Job has just lost his property. Job has lost his possessions. Job has lost his children. Imagine that. He's lost his his children. A great wind blows while his children are gathered in a house feasting. And the great wind blows and hits the four corners of the house. And the house comes crumbling down. And all of Job's children, they are killed. Job is mourning in dust and ashes. And Eliphaz's argument is basically this. Job, if you're you're living a righteous life, then God will protect you and things will be great. Job, if you're living an unrighteous life, if you're doing things that are bad, well, then obviously God's not going to protect you and things are going to go really bad for you. Eliphaz was basically presenting to Job an ancient form of the prosperity gospel. Do good and things will go good. Do bad and and things will go bad. The Bible teaches something different. The Bible teaches that the Lord protects his people. The Bible also teaches that hardship should not be seen as evidence to the contrary. In other words, the Bible teaches that suffering does not mean that God does not care. It is possible for us to be suffering and for God to be protecting his people at the very same time. Over the years, I have sat with many of you in your homes and I've listened to you share your experiences of the Christian life. And and many of you have very similar stories. You, You tell of times in your life of very severe hardship and yet you're able to testify of how the Lord has helped you, how the Lord has been with you, how the Lord has restored and protected your soul through all those difficulties. As I've listened to you, I've I've listened to people who have a depth of faith, a depth of faith. They are trusting, you are trusting in the unseen God through the painful experiences 
of life. You may have been hoping in this build-up that I was going to then, for the rest of the sermon, try and answer the question, why does God allow suffering? Or people put it in another way. They say, why do, do bad things happen to, to good people? You know, this is a question that, Chris, that Christian theologians and, and theologians from other religions have been asking for many centuries. Philosophers of all schools, they have tried to answer this question as well. Why is there suffering in the world? But there isn't a clear answer that is given to us through philosophy, not even through theology. The Bible never really tries to answer the question for us, why does God allow suffering? Instead, what it shows us is God's protection through the pain. Today, I want us to look at 1 Samuel chapter 19 and notice how the Lord protects David. And as we see the Lord protecting David, I want us then to draw out lessons for ourselves. But we need to begin by looking at the history surrounding this chapter. This will help us to to get a better understanding of what is going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with the history bit, and then we're going to look at the main bit, and then there's going to be the lessons bit. That's the the structure of, of today's sermon. So firstly, let's begin with the history bit. This is just a a quick revision of what we saw last time when we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 18. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 19, but as we look at the history, let's just focus on chapter 18 for a few minutes. Last time I said that we could call this section horrible histories. This is the horrible histories bit. There, there is much about history that is horrible, and the Bible presents history to us as it was, rather than a a 21st century sanitized, wash your hands for 20 seconds version. But in these horrible histories, we find much that we can learn for 21st century life. David, we see in 1 Samuel chapter 18, he has been anointed king of Israel. He has been chosen as the Lord's king for the Lord's chosen people. But even though he is king, he must wait Saul is on the throne. The Lord has torn the kingdom from Saul. The Lord has anointed David to be king. But for now, Saul remains on the throne and David must wait to become the king. And as David waits to become king, he remains an officer in Saul's army. In fact, he remains a very loyal officer in Saul's army. David leads Saul's army into battles against the Philistines. And the more David fights, the more successful he becomes. We read at the end of chapter 18 that David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. In chapter 18, Saul makes several attempts to get rid of David. He is envious of David. Saul knows that David is the Lord's new king. He knows that David is the Lord's anointed. And instead of submitting to the will of the Lord, his envy grows. He thinks to himself, I I must get rid of this young man. Chapter 18 tells us of a number of ways that Saul tries to kill David twice We are told in verse 11 that Saul tries to pin David to to the wall with a spear. David is playing the lyre. An evil spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul. Saul picks up his spear and he tries to pin David against the wall. Each time that Saul does this, David manages to elude him. David must have had quick reflexes. If you're a cricket fan and and you watch cricket in in the 90s, you may remember the South African fielder, John T. Rhodes. He's considered to be one of the greatest fielders of all time by many people. He, He used to amaze the crowds. He used to amaze me as a teenage boy watching cricket with his his quick reflexes. He would field at backward point. He'd go this way. He'd go that way. He'd go up. He'd go down. He was able to catch almost any ball that came in in his area of of fielding. He had incredibly quick reflexes. We see here that that, that David has quick reflexes like John T. Rhodes, perhaps even quicker. In verse 17, we see another way that Saul tries to kill David. We we see that Saul's motive for, for keeping David in his army is Saul's hope 
that David will be killed by a Philistine in battle. And then in verses 20 to 25, we read of another way that Saul tries to kill David. Saul suggests to giving his daughter Michal in marriage to David, but only after David pays the bridal price of 100 Philistine foreskins. We read at the end of verse 25 of chapter 18, Saul's plan was for David to fall by the hands of the Philistines. So that's the the history bit. But before we move on to the main bit, uh, I do want us to think a little about what is going on here. Saul knows that the Lord is with David. He knows it. Saul knows that the Lord is with David. Saul knows that David is the Lord's anointed. But still, he opposes David. Saul opposes the Lord. This pattern, as we read the New Testament, we see that this pattern is repeated throughout the New Testament. When people oppose Jesus, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Lord's anointed. It was so obvious who he was. He he was a man accredited by God to the people of Israel by signs and wonders and miracles, which God did among them through him. But they still rejected him. And people, they still reject the Lord's anointed today. The pattern we see in 1 Samuel is repeated in the 21st century. And Saul was lost. There was no hope for this man. The Lord had left him, we read in the earlier chapters. But if you have rejected the Lord's Messiah, there is still hope for you. There is still time for you to repent. It is possible that you have been listening to messages like this for a long time. Maybe you've started to join in to Christian messages during this pandemic and and you've heard preachers speaking to you. You've listened to them online or you've heard them speaking in a video message like this. And you've heard of how Jesus is God's Messiah, the one that God sent to redeem the world from their sins. And and deep in your heart, you know it to be true, but what you've been doing is you've been rejecting it. You've been holding this message at arm's length. You, You know it to be true, but you're holding Christ away. Well, what do you need to do? Well, don't be like Saul who rejected the Lord's anointed. You need to repent. You need to turn to Jesus Christ. If you are cut to the heart by the message of the Savior through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord's anointed, you need to turn to him. A preacher once said while preaching to his congregation, the same sun, the sun in the sky, the same sun that melts the wax, it hardens the clay. And you see the Lord's anointed, the truth of God, it it hardens Saul's heart. But the preaching of the Lord's anointed today, the preaching of Jesus Christ, maybe it can melt your heart. If it does, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the history bit. We're now going to move on to the main bit. This is chapter 19. And if you want a summary of this chapter in a sentence, I I can give it to you. Here it is. Saul tries to kill David while Jonathan, Michael, and Samuel protect him. That's a summary of this chapter. Saul tries to kill David while Jonathan, Michael, and Samuel protect him. So let's look at Jonathan, then we'll look at Michael, and then we'll look at Samuel and see how they protect David. First, in verses 1 to 7, Jonathan protects David. In verse 1, Saul tells his son Jonathan, and he tells all the king's attendants to kill David. Well, how does Jonathan respond? Well, Jonathan is one in spirit with David. He loves David. David is his closest friend. And so Jonathan, how does he respond? Well, he responds firstly by warning David, and then he responds by calming his father's anger. Jonathan calms his father's anger by saying in verses 4 and 5, don't you remember, paraphrasing now, but he says, don't you remember how uh, David 
risked his life for you with that Philistine Goliath. He took his own life into his own hands and he fought Goliath and the Lord won a great battle for you through him. Would you kill someone who's done something like this for you? Would you kill an innocent man? Would you kill David for no reason? So in verses 1 to 7, Jonathan protects David. In verses 8 to 18, we see Michal protecting David. After Jonathan mollifies the king, we read these words in verse 8, which took place sometime after, chapter 19 and verse 8. Once war broke out, once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. Verse 9 says that an evil spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul, and then it says that Saul tries to kill David with a spear again. David is playing the lyre, and Saul picks up his spear. Now, now talk about a tough gig. I, I mean, I've heard of bands being driven off the stage, or people booing the band, or people throwing things at the band. But picking up a spear? Picking up a spear to kill him? Saul again, he tries to pin David to the wall with a spear. And now David isn't hanging out around anymore, no matter how soothing a word Jonathan can whisper in the king's ear. David goes home, but Saul sends men to watch David's house. The plan is for them to kill David when he leaves his house in the morning. There's, there's something in this which I find so shocking. Something I find so shocking, so disturbing, which demonstrates the depths to which Saul has descended. Did you spot it? This is Saul's own daughter's house. He sends men, he sends armed men, he sends violent men to watch the house of his own daughter and her husband, and then to kill her husband. This man has sunk very low. Fathers, those of you who have daughters, can you imagine doing such a thing to your own daughter? Saul really isn't thinking straight, but at least his own children are thinking clearly. Michal says to David in verse 11, Michal says to him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. And together, Michal and David, they act quickly. Michal lets David down through a window and he runs for it. He, he makes his escape. In, in the matter of a few hours, he goes from being an, army in the, an officer in the king's army to being a runaway refugee. Not long ago, I was, uh, was re-watching re that, that old war film, The Great Escape, with Steve McQueen about British and American soldiers who escaped from a German prisoner of, of war camp during the Second World War. It's got that catchy theme tune, and, and uh, you can whistle along, and maybe you're whistling now as I speak to you. And the film, it's quite a lot of fun, especially with that theme tune in, in your head. It's, just, it's quite a lot of fun to watch. But I'm not sure the real life experiences of those in the prisoner of war camp were quite as fun as the film seems to portray. It must have been terrifying. And this escape for David from his own home as his wife lets him out through a window, it must have been terrifying. It must have been terrifying. Quick, David, Michal says, not a moment to lose. Out of the window, does, does Michal tie a bed sheets together. Run, David, run, don't look back. Your life depends on it. There are many brave women in the Bible. There's, there's Esther, there's Rahab, there's Deborah, there's Mary, there's, there's, there's Phoebe. I think Michal should be ranked among them. What Michal does here is heroic, and we hardly notice. We tend to think of Michal as the one who complains about David's undignified dancing when the Ark of the Covenant returns in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But here we see Michal showing great courage. You say, well, she told lies, she was deceiving. Yes, but, but so did Rahab and, and so did Esther. Michal is incredibly brave, braver, let's be honest, guys, than, than most men would be. 
While David is escaping into the night, Michal takes an idol and she lays it on the bed. She covers it with a garment. She puts some goat's hair at the head and she does this at great personal cost, risking the fury of her own father who is not in his right mind. Michal, she's a complicated character in the Bible. And we can see that, and you can maybe read it for yourself, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We see that she's a complicated character, but at least here she strikes me as a good example of putting the Lord's anointed first, despite the pain, despite the hardship, despite the suffering. Nigel preached to us last time from words in Matthew chapter 10. These words that, that Jesus said, they're relevant for us today. Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. So Jonathan protects David in verses 1 to 7. Michal protects David in verses 8 to 18. And third, in verses 19 to 24, Samuel and the prophets protect David. Saul hears that David has taken refuge in in Ramah. David has been living in Gibeah. Ramah is about two to three miles north of of Gibeah. Uh, So David has run, as it were, from from one side of Wrexham to the other. So from the Wrexham town centre, kind of run to the other side of, of Acton Park. That's the sort of distance that he has run. And it's not far, and therefore it's not long before Saul's armed men catch up with with David. But David is with, with whom? David's with Samuel. He's with the prophet Samuel. One group of Saul's men come to capture David, but they are met by some prophets. Chapter 19 and verse 20 tells us what happens. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul is told about this and so Saul sends some more men. Maybe Saul thinks these men are particularly vile and they won't be affected by this prophesying thing that's going on. But the same thing happens. And then Saul sends more men and the same thing happens. Finally, Saul goes himself and he too prophesies. And then he strips off his clothes in the presence of Samuel and prophesies some more. We see that in verse 24. Now, I'm sure that most of you are thinking what I was thinking as as I studied this passage in the week. What are you thinking? You're thinking like me, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. I I found it a little weird. And if I'm honest, as I read it, I had no idea how to interpret it. And so what I do in these circumstances is I read what others have said. So I read around and found a few things which I I think were helpful. Let me just summarize some of my reading uh, about this rather weird section of Scripture. What is this prophesying that that is going on? Well, the prophesying that these men are doing, they're prophesying words of prayer and praise. Saul had sent these men to do something evil, But instead of being able to carry out this evil act that Saul had sent them to do, the Spirit of God had come upon these men and they were now prophesying and praising God, unable to do what Saul wanted them to do. It's possible also that as they were prophesying, they were rebuking one another for carrying out this evil act that Saul had sent them to do. When the same thing happens to Saul, the Spirit is sending a message to Saul. The Lord is saying to Saul, I'm in charge. I'm in charge, Saul, not you. And even your will must bow down to my sovereign will. As one writer said, the aggressive, angry king is humbled 
and even comically humiliated. He, he strips off his clothes, and the stripping of his clothes is another picture of the kingdom being stripped from Saul. It's taken away from him. So what's going on in this rather strange section of Scripture? The Lord is sending a message. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Evil is at work. And we can think of this world in which we live with with evil at work and troubling things that are happening. But the Lord continues to send us a message. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. The Lord is in charge. So that's the main bit. And here's a summary of chapter 19 again. Saul tries to kill David, while Jonathan, Michal, and Samuel protect him. And now we're going to move on to the lessons bit. And this bit is a little bit shorter, and it's really the conclusion of the message. The lessons bit. Here's lesson number one. Lesson number one is about the unseen hand of God. The unseen hand of God. I found spending some time in 1 Samuel chapter 19, I found it a little bit like reading the book of Esther. And if you've read the book of Esther, you'll know that uh, God's name is not mentioned once in the book. And yet all the time, the Lord is at work behind the scenes. There is uh, Esther and Mordecai. They are doing their best to protect the Lord's people. God's name is not mentioned. Yet we can trace the hand of God working to look after and to protect his people from the seats looking at the stage as it were as you read the book of Esther it tells us look we can see all that Esther and Mordecai are doing on the stage but backstage behind the scene the Lord the the director as it were is the one who is making it all happen when we read about Jonathan and Michal protecting David There is not much mention of the Lord's activity, but all the time we know he is there. The Lord is at work. He is protecting his anointed one. And then in Ramah, suddenly with the Spirit of God coming upon these people, it is clear that the Lord is at work. The Lord is the one who is guiding everything. The Lord is protecting his anointed. The Spirit descends. It was the Lord's action that was keeping David alive all along. Don't we see some of the things happening in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ? There were many times in his life when people wanted to kill him and many times in his life when people could have killed him. Once we think of that time when Jesus was in his hometown and the things that he had said to the people that he had grew up amongst and had watched him grow up, the things that he said, they infuriated the people. They made them so angry that they grabbed him and they took him to the brow of the hill where the city was built and they intended to throw him off a cliff and to kill him. But the scriptures tell us that the Lord was protecting his anointed and that Jesus walked straight through them and he went on his way. You see, all the time behind the scenes, the Lord was protecting his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Until one day, what do we read in the scriptures? We read that the Lord removed his hand of protection from his anointed one. The people could not kill Jesus without the will of the Lord. As Isaiah 53 says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. So the Lord, at the end of Jesus's life, he removes his protecting hand from his anointed one. And why does he do this? He has Jesus, allows this, these people to take him and put him on a cross so that we could know the grace of God, so that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we could then come under his protection and care, so that we would experience the protection of the Lord forever. The protection was removed from Jesus, so that we could be protected by the Lord forever. You know, it's it's possible for us to experience hardships and to think that the Lord is not protecting us, but all the time, The unseen hand of the Lord, he is at work behind the scenes. Not a hair, not a hair can fall from our head unless the Lord wills it. Not one, not one, nothing can touch us without the will of the Lord as as we see in the book of Job. And therefore we can know that when hardship does come, it must serve a higher purpose 
and it is part of God's eternal protection and security. I remember Jim Moore, we miss him, don't we? I remember Jim Moore uh, saying once in a prayer meeting, he, he was speaking about the eternal security. That was a theme that Jim loved to speak about. And he, he spoke about how we are in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, quoting from the scriptures, of course. We are in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gave this picture of how the Father's hand is over the Lord Jesus' hand. We're in the Father's hand as well. We are protected. We are secure. We are kept by the unseen hand of God. Here's lesson number two. This is our final lesson. Where are we in the story? Where are we in the story? When we read the Bible, this is sometimes a helpful question to ask, and we can learn some lessons for ourselves. But it's only a helpful question to ask if we make the right application. Otherwise, we can get ourselves tangled up in, in all sorts of knots. I suppose our gut reaction might be to think of ourselves as, of who? As who? T to think of ourselves as, as David. And that just like David, the Lord is protecting us. And in some sense, that may be helpful. But I think the thing to do here is to see ourselves in this passage, either as Saul rejecting the Lord's anointed and therefore rejecting the Lord's protection, or to see ourselves as either Jonathan or Michael or Samuel receiving the Lord's anointed and receiving his promises of guidance and protection and remaining loyal to the Lord's anointed, no matter the hardships that that may bring our way. We've spoken about rejecting him already, and I've urged you not to do that. I'm asking you now, if you'll remain loyal to him, will you remain loyal to him? Will you remain loyal to the Lord's anointed, to Jesus Christ, despite the pain, despite the suffering, despite the hardship, holding on to him no matter what, no matter the cost. That's what Jonathan and Michal and Samuel did for David. And that's what the Lord calls us to do for him. So in conclusion, we've, we've looked at the history bit, and we've looked at the main bit, and we've looked at the lessons bit. In preparation for next time, you may want to read 1 Samuel chapter 20. We'll come to that in a couple of weeks' time. Let's close with prayer. Father, we know that you are good and that you hear those who call upon you. Give to us and to all your people what is best for us, that we may glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If you have a Christian hymns hymn book in front of you, it's number 422. What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Joyful.